Hello, folks. Um, the slides are online, or should be shortly anyway, once my whole Git update process works. Um, let's jump right into it. Tomorrow morning, I'll give a keynote that talks a little bit more sort of about non-technical bits of PHP and how we got to where we are. Today, it's the more technical talk that I will refer to tomorrow as, if you want to hear more, come to my technical talk yesterday. Right? <laughs> Which you did. So your time travel worked perfectly. Congratulations. Your time machines are A-OK. -okay. Um, how many here are on PHP 5.4 already? That's not enough, people. Come on. OK, 5.3? Uh, 5.2? Something before 5.2? Okay, or nobody will admit to it at least, that's good. <laughs> but the guy on 5.2, you shouldn't be here, you should be back upgrading. You do not have time to sit here. <laughs> All right, so hopefully I can convince most of you to go home and upgrade to 5.4 now, basically, tonight. Um, we have a lot of very good improvements in 5.4 over 5.3. Big performance improvements in those features listed there. Um, one of them being the silent operator is now not super duper slow that, like it used to be. Um, string constants are pretty interesting too. So if you have a lot of actual string constants throughout your files, you have templates with string constants in them, and those same string constants repeat in multiple places, this all gets basically fold it down into a single string constant in, in one place, and it saves quite a bit of memory, depending on how you've written your code. Um, and I'll show you some numbers later on that. There's a built-in web server, which please, please, please don't use it as your production web server, but it is handy. I figure more IDEs and things will start using the built-in web server. You can just do PHP minus S um, in a directory, basically, and then PHP starts up, and that's the doc root so if you have a bunch of PHP files in the directory and you want to hit those files with your browser, type PHP minus capital S in that directory. You can also put minus S and put a port on it and just hit your, your server or hit your machine, basically your machine's IP, and it'll serve up those files. You can feed it a, a front-end controller. So most frameworks have a front-end controller. If you feed it that, then your entire framework should work nicely. And frameworks are starting to come around to that and starting to add documentation, saying if you just want to run and test your application from the command line, here's the, the framework controller you, that you have to feed to PHP minus S, and it'll just go. So you don't need to fiddle around with the web server to, to actually test your code. I use it a lot for debugging PHP so that I can just fire up um, a PHP session and inside GDB or Valgrind and, and play around with it without having the extra overhead of a web server involved. Um, probably the biggest feature in 5.4 are traits. Basically horizontal code reuse. I like to just think of it as a compiler assisted copy and paste. So basically you can define a trait and you say here's a trait and that trait you do trait uh, the name of the trait, curly braces, and then you put whatever you want in there. You put functions, properties, whatever. And then inside a class, you can say use the name of that trait. And it's just like the compiler copies that block of code into your class. So instead of having a base class called base, which you see a lot of out there, and everything ex extends base, which makes no sense from an OO perspective, because you have two different classes that have nothing to do with each other inheriting from the same generic base class just because you have some generic functions that you want every class in your framework or in your, in your application to use, like maybe a logging class, for example. But just because you have a logging set of functions does not mean that two different classes should be related, right? So that's the problem that traits tries to solve. It's a bit like mix-ins. Except mixins, there's no conflict resolution. Basically, the last mixin always wins. With traits, there's conflict resolution. And if you use two traits in the same class that implement the same methods, you're going to get an error. The compiler's going to say, wait a second. You use two traits. You have log method in both of them. I don't know which one to use. You have to resolve that conflict. It's not just the last one wins. 
uh, which makes it a little bit more flexible as well because you can alias things. You can say use trait but alias log to log two, for example. Then you can have access to both log functions from two different traits um, if you need to. Another new feature is short array syntax. So you can drop the array bracket bracket and you can just use square brackets for arrays. You can do a function array referencing, FAD as we call it. Um, basically you can call a function, if that function returns an array, you can dereference it on the function call directly. Closures were introduced in 5.3, but we hadn't quite wrapped our heads around what to do about this. If you have a closure inside a method, inside an object, and that closure tries to access a uh, private property from that class, for example, and it returns that closure to outside of the class, should you still have access to the private property from that closure? I mean, it's not completely obvious that, because here I call the function to get this printer closure, right? And I'm calling a method that's essentially outside of the class that tries to access a private property. And we sort of went back and forth on it in 5.3, and we didn't quite wrap our heads around it, so we just said, well, well, we'll, we'll solve it later. And now we've solved it in 5.4, and yes, you do have access to it. Basically, we figured, well, you're the idiot who created the closure inside the class that accessed the private property. <laughs> I mean, at the time, in here where you define it, you have access to the private property inside there. You should know what you're doing, right? If you choose to leak a closure that accesses a private property, that's your damn fault. We're going to let you do it, <laughs> right? So, <clears throat> if you don't want that, then don't do that. Um, the short echo syntax is always available now. You don't have to have short tags enabled. It was kind of silly that this was linked to short tags, because the whole point of short tags, uh, of, of the turning off short tags, was that the bracket question mark conflicted with the XML uh, PI or process instruction tag, right? So other things that uses bracket question mark like XML would conflict. So if you have short tags turned on in PHP and you have a mix of XML and PHP in the file, the PHP parser would blow up. Um, but bracket question mark equals doesn't conflict with anything. Equals is basically a new namespace inside this PI tag and as long as nobody else uses that equals namespace then it's fine. You can have these types of tags mixed in with XML and with PHP tags, and it's fine. Um, templating systems will like the fact that they're no longer reliant on short tags being on for that to work. There's a new session object. So when you have your user-defined session storage functions, you know you have six functions that you have to register. Now you can just implement um, the session, this new session object, and have those six methods inside the object, and you can just say, this is my session storage object. Makes for boilerplate code a little bit less painful. Um, there's a callable type hint, so any sort of function that takes a callable, basically a closure, essentially. There are other things that are callables, but mostly it's for closures. So if you're passing closures around and you have something that really takes a closure, you can type hint and say, this, this has to take a closure. Generally, we avoid type hints in PHP, except in cases where there's no chance of that argument being interchangeable with something else. People always ask for like a string type hint or an int type hint, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a loosely typed language, especially a language that's geared for the web. And, and since the web isn't typed, you're always going to be passing around stuff in strings, because everything comes across the wire in strings. And even from your back end, most database APIs don't provide you typed information either. So you do a MySQL call, you get strings back. And you want to pass these things around without doing a lot of type juggling. So we don't want to do static typing. But for certain things, like if you're passing a closure in, there's no way to convert uh, something else to a closure. If you pass in integer 3, and then there's something inside this function tries to call it as a function, there's just no way to call integer 3 as a function. It's not a function, right? It's not a callable. So that's why we, we've added this callable type hint. It goes along with our object typed hints and other things we've added in, in the past. We have much better support for Asian characters in special chars and entities now. 
Also, if you're doing multibyte stuff, before you had to, at compile time, you had to build PHP with multibyte, multibyte support, and you can do that as a configuration option now after compile time, which makes things a little bit more flexible. There's some JSON improvements. Uh, one of them is we have a JSON serializable interface that you can implement. So you can implement the interface and provide a JSON serialized method in your object. So if something tries to JSON encode your object, you have control over what happens, um, what, what you end up getting back from a JSON encode of your object. We've switched over to using the MySQL ND uh, library now everywhere. This is a library that was written specifically for PHP. The previous, or the, the one we used before, the MySQL client library that everybody else uses as well, it does its own memory ma management. It does its own thing. What happens then is that when you make a query to the database, you select star from some table, you get a result back. That gets malloced in the lib MySQL client library. So you have a big chunk of memory allocated. And then in your PHP application, as you're selecting rows, and give me the first row, please, MySQL fetch, whatever, right? You get the first row back. And that then has to allocate memory on the PHP side. But we're in the same process. I mean, libmysql client is linked into PHP. So you've already malloced all this memory, but you end up allocating it again. If you do a fetch all, fetching all the rows into PHP, you end up with two copies of your database result. And that's what everybody else does as well. If you use the MySQL client library, it will do all its own allocation. Now the MySQL ND library uses the PHP memory manager. So when it gets the result from the server, it uses the PHP memory ma manager to allocate the memory. And it's already on the PHP side. When you do a MySQL fetch row, it's already there. So you never have two copies of anything. So from a memory perspective, it's much more memory efficient. You're basically using half the memory when using MySQL ND with PHP. Well, it depends. I mean, you don't download binaries from PHP usually. You, you download it from your distro. And the distro can choose not to do that. You can still force PHP to build against the system's MySQL client library. So if you do configure minus minus with it, MySQL I equals user slash user, it forces it to go and use the MySQL, MySQL client library that the system came with. If you don't specify, if you just say with MySQL at compile time, it will use MySQL ND now. We're trying to send a hint to the distros. This is a good idea, guys. Let's, let's please provide our users with this. Now, but we can't really control it. A lot of these folks like having just one MySQL client library that everything uses. So your Python, Ruby, everything uses the same MySQL client library. So they upgrade it once, and everything on the system will have this upgraded library. They hate these one-offs, like, like MySQL ND. But at the same time, there's a big performance benefit and memory benefit to, to trying new things like MySQL ND. So you can check your PHP info to make sure. You know the PHP info screen. You can check to see which library it's using. And I think some of the distros have switched to, to using it now. Um, Iterator support, MySQL I. There's a new binary notation. Just like you can do 0x for hexadecimal, you can do 0b now for binary. Very minor feature. And a few other minor things in here. Um, there's a request time float. We had server request time that gives you the timestamp of the request. For busier systems, that's not granular enough. So you can get it down to the microsecond now for, for the request. Generally, this is to avoid having to call time all the time in your application. Usually, you actually just want the timestamp of the request. You don't necessarily need the timestamp at whatever point in your PHP code that you want to call time. And then if you're calling it multiple times, it's just a waste of a system call to keep calling it. So usually, it's a good idea just to use server request time or request time float. All right, a little bit on performance. So this is from real live traffic, very, very live traffic. Um, it's four servers. Behind the load balance, we're getting exactly the same traffic, essentially, on average anyway. Um, Web 207 and 208, the blue and red, are 5.4 servers with op cache. And the yellow and green are 5.3 with APC. 
both well tuned because I tuned both of them. Um, and <laughs> and this first one is CPU, so the user CPU, and you can see we dropped about. 25% basically in terms of we're using 25% less user CPU on exactly the same load by switching to 5.4 plus upcache. On system CPU, dropped about the same, maybe a little bit less on the system CPU. But again, you can see blue and red are much better. On memory usage, so this is the Apache, this is, these are both using Apache, um, and the memory usage dropped from about 24 megabytes down to about 19 and a bit. So the average here is 24.1 down to about 19.1. So we dropped about five megs out of 20. So about 20% memory usage as well dropped. And there are no application changes here. It just means that on average, per request, we are allocating five megs less. And that's not against the Um, this is a database back site. So this is, this, is on, this is Etsy. This is a huge application with tons and tons of traffic. And this is an average across all requests. Um, on average, across all requests, we're, av we're allocating less memory per request. And some requests obviously allocate a lot more. Some requests allocate a lot less. Um, but on average, it dropped. Um, because it's more, f basically it's more efficient in, in many ways. The executor in PHP 5.4 has a lot of little speed ups. Um, so first of all, because we need to allocate less memory, when you allocate less memory, you end up using a bit less CPU because there's less, there's less bumping, bumping around, looking up stuff and doing things. Um, the repeated runtime function binding as well. It's a little bit better in it. The string constants being more efficient. So there's a whole bunch of things. I mean, you're basically asking, how can you speed up code and you f make it use less CPU? I mean, it's, it's simply optimizing code. It's simply writing code that's more efficient, trying to get rid of extra loops, trying to get rid of extra checks, trying to get rid of extra system calls, trying to get rid of all kinds of things. And that's optimization. It's yeah, software it's that evolves. No, no, no. It's when you're talking about user CPU. So when you do a top on the system, for example, let me show you. No, I, okay, I, I, I misunderstood your question. Where is my cursor? Here. So if you do top here, um, does top even show it? No. So the user is PHP. Well, I mean, uh, hold on. Let's start one. So here we have CPU usage. You have different things. You have what's called user CPU and you have system CPU. So how do I explain that easily? Uh, system CPU is the amount of time spent in system calls and doing things sort of at the operating system level. So talking to the file system, doing, doing things like that. User CPU part of an application is time spent in the application code itself. So if you do a while true loop that just sits in loops, doesn't touch the file system, doesn't touch any system calls, doesn't call time or anything like that, it just sits and spins the CPU doing absolutely nothing, that's all user CPU time. So it's a user application just sitting there spinning. System CPU is if you're sitting there reading files like crazy. Then there's a lot of time spent in the operating system talking to, to things, talking to maybe network I.O., doing system calls, things like that. That's system CPU. And when you look at an application, how it uses the system, you, you tend to split it up to see where's the load. Wrong keyboard. Right, so those were the two things. So I'm just basically saying that both system and user CPU is much lower in 5.4. Um, average memory we looked at. And finally, probably the most important, this is the PERC 95, so the 95th percentile uh, system latency. And the latency is simply how long does it take for that page to be served up? And the Yellow and green, before the upgrade, it was taking on average 590 milliseconds to serve up an Etsy page. 
after the upgrade, it dropped to about 481. So about 110 milliseconds faster, right? So what's that? It's 15, 20% increase, right? And again, no code changes. We simply, we gained 100 milliseconds simply by doing that upgrade to, from 5.3 to 5.4. And these are the kinds of things we look at when we are playing around with PHP and when we're evaluating features and when we're looking at how we're going to improve PHP. Right from the very start of the PHP project, it's been all about performance. It's been all about how do we serve up web pages really, really fast. Besides the memory, reduced memory allocation, what else do you attribute that performance improvement to? Um, well, the, the fact that we're doing less system calls means that we're, I mean, e everything kind of comes together. Um, and since we're spending less time doing system calls, we're spending less time in user CPU land, it just means that things are happening faster, which means that we get through the request faster, which means we serve up things faster. So, um, the, the, there, and there are multiple factors. First of all, op cache is slightly faster than APC. It's about 10 to 15% faster. One of the reasons is that APC uses a full memory manager to try to reclaim memory whereas op cache is kind of stupid about how it allocates memory. It just has hash slots and it just keeps putting stuff in there. It never tries to reclaim used hash slots. So once you've filled up your opcode cache, it just starts over. It dumps the whole thing and then starts filling it up sequentially, like slot one used, slot two used, slot three used, slot four used. Once it gets to the end of all its available slots, well, wipe them all out and start again from one, two, three, four, five. APC tries to figure out, okay, well, we're gonna allocate this operate in this slot here. But then when we know that this operate is no longer needed, we free up that slot. And if there are two slots next to each other that are both freed up, we combine them together saying, okay, now we have a bigger memory chunk that's available that we can then use. So it's a, it's a full memory manager that tries to be smart about memory management, which means that we try to make sure that we, we don't use more memory than we need. So there's a trade-off there that we use a bit more shared memory, but we go faster in opcache. With APC, uses less memory, but it's a bit slower because there's more checks along the way. And there are all kinds of decisions like that, but we have to look at it and go, well, there are trade-offs. Should we use a little bit more memory and get more performance, or do we go the other way in other times? Um, and it turned out the APC approach probably wasn't great because it was a bit slower and it was way more complex. So this new op cache is much less complex and less likely to, get to crash as well. So upgrading to 5.4, things that might trip you up if you're on 5.3 or earlier. The default char set is now UTF-8 for HTML special chars and entities. Hopefully your apps are already all UTF-8. If they aren't, maybe that's the first thing you should be doing before you upgrade is migrate your stuff over to UTF-8. We live in the Unicode world, like it or not, and we have to get there. Now, if you are on ISO 8859-1 still, and you upgrade to 5.4, you're gonna get a lot of empty strings back from HTML special chars, most likely. Because it'll if it sees an invalid um, character, something that's not a valid UTF-8 character, it's not going to return anything to you. It's just going to give you an empty string. Unless you specify, and you can specify in the final argument here, you can specify, well, I actually want ISO 8859-1. Um, but you have to go through and fix all your calls to HTML special chars for that. If you're already in UTF-8, you don't have to worry about any of this. Um, there's a new warning, that, or to know this actually, if you're doing an array to string conversion, basically if you try to echo out an array, and I'm sure everyone here has done that, where you see the string array show up on your web page, right? Generally that's a bug, right? There are easier ways of outputting the string array than converting an array to a string, right? It's usually wrong. Um, so, but before we didn't have an error, we just happily showed you this array string, um, but now we throw a notice so that in your error log, when you go through it, you can actually see, oh, wait a second, I probably have a bug here. Um, what might trip you up, though, not necessarily this part, because th these ones are pretty obvious. If you're just echoing out arrays, that's pretty obvious. Less obvious is when you do something like array diff. Array diff is only single level, but people don't necessarily know that. So if you're trying to get the difference between two arrays here, 
you're going to get an a array to string conversion notice because since it's only a single level array diff that it's doing, it goes through and takes each element of the, ar of the two arrays and compares them. And here it has to compare three to an array. And it's going to convert this to the string array here because this is a nested array just containing the number three. So you're going to get a notice on this one. And it's going to try to compare the two. And if this element here had been the string array, right, then these two would have shown no difference, actually. It would happily have said 1, 2, 3 string array is the same as 1, 2, 3 with a nested array, regardless of what's in that value. And it, that would be a bug that you wouldn't have noticed in PHP 5.3. In 5.4, it's going to throw a notice saying, hey, wait a second. That's probably not what you meant. Register globals is now completely removed. I mean, we turned it off by default, I don't know, eight years ago. But you could still force it back on in your INI. Now, even if you try to turn it back on in your INI, it's not going to be there. The code is not there anymore. Magic quotes are completely removed as well. We also removed uh, variable breaks and continues. Now, hopefully, it's not something you use anywhere. Basically, we haven't removed multi-level breaks and continues. It's only if you use the variable there, right? So if you're doing continue dollar var and you have var sets or something weird, it's not going to work. Um, and, but it was a pretty strange thing to do anyway. We had to add a max input vars thing. We have a really fast hash algorithm, but it's not very safe um, when it comes to people trying to intentionally create collisions in the hash. So if you craft a whole bunch of post variable names or post field names exactly the right way, and you post, you do a request with like a million post elements to a PHP, site, then you can cause all those fields to hash to the same hash bucket because of the way the hash algorithm works. And that's called a hash collision attack. And because they all hash to the same bucket, internally in PHP there's a linked list for each bucket. I mean, a, a real, a true normal hash, everything will hash sort of on average to different buckets. So you never have very long links. But if you force everything to the same bucket, you can end up with a million links on the same bucket, which means every time you add a new one, PHP has to start at the beginning and link all the way to the end to add it. And then million and one has to do another million links and add one. Million and two, million links and add to the end, right? Which means PHP will slow to a crawl as you're adding them. And it, it can do a thousand links of these super fast. You don't even notice it. But once you get up into the millions, it really slows to a crawl and eats up your CPU and it's basically uh, a DOS attack. So by default, we have now limited the number of, of fields. So that's the number of get, post, cookies, whatever. Normally on the request, you're not going to have a thousand get fields. I mean, it doesn't even fit in the URL, right? You normally don't have a thousand form fields on the post either, except if you're PayPal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so PayPal's IDN or IPN, whatever it's called, Instant Payment Notification API, if you send it a big thing, it's, it posts back thousands, potentially, of, of, of post fields in a single request. It's very, very crazy. We never thought we would actually get anywhere near that limit. The first time I saw it being hit was actually at Etsy because our IPM from PayPal stopped working. So if, if you find that suddenly you're losing the end of your posts, you may need to go in and increase max input vars. But hopefully, you don't need to do that. So that could trip you up on the 5.4 upgrade as well. Um, if you had functions named callable instead of and trait, those are now going to break your application because these are now reserved words in 5.4. Hopefully you didn't have those. Um, yeah, I mean, here, if you extend an abstract constructor, the signatures have to match. We didn't enforce that in 5.3, so you might get an error on that. But that's basically a bug. You should be fixing it anyway. Slight differences in a couple of functions here and there. Stream select preserves keys, the array argument, 
Um, nothing really interesting in those others. Um, date time defaults to UTC if you don't set it now. And if you're using Tiger Hash, there's a bit of a problem. If all your passwords are Tiger Hashed in your current, applica current application, you're going to have to rehash them all. Um, look at PHP bug 61307 for, for some helpful solutions to that. But very few people are actually using Tiger Hashing for passwords. Um, but if you happen to be in that boat, you're kind of in trouble on your upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't necessarily our problem, though. I mean, it, it was, <laughs> it's the crypt library itself, but I mean, it, it, it does relate to PHP. All right, so some other helpful hints. Please turn on error reporting in your app. Turn on all the bits. The, the easy way to do that is just to set it to minus one. Right? Because error reporting is a bit field. You can put in all the different ones, warning, notice, whatever. You can order them all together. But just set it to minus one. Turns on all the bits, past, present, future bits, all turned on. And it'll then catch silly stuff like this. Right? I mean, there, there are bit, bits of errors in there that you need to, um, that you really should be catching. You should be initializing your arrays. You should be doing things. And error reporting minus one will tell you all these things. So. The reason, the big reason to do it is if you have a user-defined error handling function, which most large applications do, frameworks do, applications you've written, you probably have your own, you've registered your own error handling function. Even with an error level turned off, even if you turn off strict or turn off notices, it's still going to call your user-defined error handler. In your user-defined error handler, you can then choose not to do anything at that point, but it ends up being a user space function call, which ends up being kind of slow. So if every page in your app generates thousands of notices, every one of those ends up calling your user defined error handler. Every one of those calls can be up to like 0.15 milliseconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but then multiply it by a thousand, right? And suddenly you have an extra 50 milliseconds latency just because you were too damn lazy to fix some notices and some strings in your code. It's not that hard to fix those, so please do it. S-trace is usually a good sanitizer. I go through, first thing I do when I go in, when someone asks me to come in and have a look at their app and say, how healthy is our application? Or is there anything we can do to speed it up? One of the first things I do is I just fire up S-trace. So you can do S-trace, you do a PS to find whatever Apache or Nginx or whatever they're using as their web server, go onto a production server, find one of the processes, attach S-trace to it, and just look at what it's doing. It'll give you a list of system calls that looks something like this. Here, I can make it bigger. All right, so a list of system calls will look something like this. It'll say it's accessing these various things. So this was an app that was using Smarty as its templating en engine. And I noticed a bunch of system calls, stat, bar, bar, www, current, lib, blah, 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 down to this point. And then it had this plugin modifier, nl to br.php. What the hell? And then also these things, where they went looking, it goes in looking for modifiers that do JSON encode, and they're not there. There is no plugin. But every single time a Smarty template tried to use JSON encode, the web server went crazy hunting around the file system looking for a plugin to figure out how to do JSON encode. Even though PHP has a perfectly fine built in JSON encode function, there's no reason to send the, the web server or send PHP on this wild goose chase looking for an override of JSON in code. Why would you want to override JSON in code? It's completely stupid. Um, so that was one of the first things I did. I ripped out all that code out of Smarty saying, well, for, for anything like this that has a built-in function, just use the built-in function right away. Don't go looking for an override for these functions. Um, and in this case as well, there was actually an override, this modified NL to BR, but that plugin, all it did was call NL to BR. <laughs> so we go hunting around the file system, we're trying to figure out how to do NL2BR. We find a little PHP plugin for Smarty that does NL2BR, and we execute it, and we're happy. I'm like, what? Makes no sense at all. Skip all this crap, just call NL2BR right away. Right? So 
this is kind of in a, in a very small example of why I have a real problem with most frameworks as well. That there are too many damn runtime checks for stupid things that will never change. You're never going to make a different NL to BR. Come on. If you are, call it something else. Right? If you want NL to BR, call it NL to BR. JSON encode, you're not going to override JSON encode. It wouldn't be JSON anymore if you did that. And most frameworks do stuff like this where you come in and the first thing it does, hey, which database are we using? MySQL. Okay, then we're going to load the MySQL driver and the ORM bits for MySQL. We do all these things. Two milliseconds later, the next request hits the web server. Hey, which database are we using? Still MySQL. Okay, then we should do this, we should do this. Makes no sense. You're not going to change your database from one millisecond to the next. You're not going to change it from one year to the next without a lot of hassle. And even if you do, flipping the driver in your framework and just saying, okay, now the driver should be hard-coded to Postgres instead of MySQL, takes you about 10 minutes of putting the code in. It's going to take you a month to fix all your schemas and to migrate the data, right? Doing a runtime check for stuff like this is insane. And it slows down everything. So yeah, this was the plugin, the Smarty plugin for an L2BR. <laughs> insane. <coughs> oh, now my font is too big. Um, the other thing I like to do is I run a profiler on things, both at the system level via call grind. Call grind is, some, is a tool inside of another tool called Valgrind. Valgrind is basically a VM, a virtual machine that is instrumentable. It means that you can go in and you can measure everything. It measures how long is spent in all the various system calls, how long is spent in various function calls and libc and all these places. Then we have the same thing at the, at the PHP level via xdebug, where you can go in and see things. So here, there was a, I was looking for, for some slowdown and related to time zones, basically. And this is what happens if you don't set your time zone in the PHP application. You get a little warning, but if you ignore the warning, it ends up spending quite a bit of time trying to guess which time zone you're in. You end up in some system calls, you end up having to escape stuff and string cops and doing the zone search and all this stuff. And in my particular case, it was 30% of my time. This was a very small application, but still 30% of my time was spent trying to figure out which time zone I'm in on every single request just because I was too lazy to hard code it in my configuration. And stuff like this you won't necessarily catch unless you profile. Then with xdebug, you can get a little picture like this with sort of your main saying, okay, you're spending 100% of your time in your application, but here's how that's distributed across the thing. Where you have, hopefully, your database call will show up on there. Here it was about 32% of my time was spent inside an actual PDO query, talking to Postgres, I think, in this case. And I spent about 5 or 6% in PREG replace. So this is sort of the, the sign of a healthy looking application. If on your database backed application, you don't see your database query in your, on your profiling, then you have issues. Because if your database query is not the slowest part of your application, then your application is crap. Because <laughs> it really should be. And that's something that, uh, as a sanity check, you can go in and use a profiler to make sure that there isn't some other box that you hadn't thought of that's eating up all your CPU. So here's WordPress. No, I mean, this is actually not bad. I mean, that first example was a trivial application. This is not bad. You should see Magento. <laughs> <laughs> Magento crashes my browser just trying to show the image <laughs> of this. WordPress is not bad. And I actually, I like, when I don't know the code, I like doing this picture first to see just sort of where are things. And if I want to speed it up, it, this tells me if it's worth my time. You don't pick a box that's only taking like 1%, like here, for example. Why would I speed up this locale in it? It's only taking 1.3% of my time. Even if I make it four times as fast, right? I've saved less than 1%. But if I take something that's taking 40% 4 of my time and just make it 10% faster, right? I get 4% back. So that's sort of the first thing I look at whenever I want to speed things up. I look at, okay, where is it worth my time to, to optimize things and where should I be looking first? I'm running out of time, all right. Um, watch out for complexity. 
This is some framework. This is a single request, and this is an, an extension called include that gives you sort of the include tree. Which files include what? And on a single request, this one framework included all this stuff. You can see this is index.php that does a require on these two files. And then this does a require on this, and then this one goes completely nuts and includes all this stuff, which then just sort of trickles down. And frankly, it's amazing it works at all. And um, it is a good sanity check to see how other control things get if you don't understand what your framework is doing. Another thing I like to do is static analysis. And the best tool out there these days is hip hop. So Facebook's VM that tries to basically compile PHP down to an executable. Now, it's very limited, the extensions it supports, and it's really hard to compile. And it's a pain in the ass, to be honest. But I like the fact that you can shortcut all this stuff and just do an analysis. And we use this at Etsy all the time. Every time we, we run our unit test, we also run the static analysis across all the code that catches silly mistakes, like undeclared, ver undeclared variables, functions that don't exist, dead code snippets, things like that. If you don't have perfect unit tests, and nobody does, doing static analysis can catch a whole bunch of things for you. And I ran it recently against WordPress, against their current tree, and opened the bug. So here, on WordPress bug 24210, right, I found 40 issues. You can see sort of the issues. And, and most of them are minor. They're not big things, but little stupid things like too many arguments, right? So somewhere they have a remove action function that's defined to take three arguments, but they call it with four. Obviously a dumb little bug, but still something that should be fixed, right? So a bunch of too many arguments, some unknown functions, uh, use void return, these tend to be pretty bad. So use void return basically means that they're calling a function that doesn't return anything. So in this case, they're doing out dot equals this thing. But since this thing doesn't return anything, it'll never add anything to the output. So it's probably a bug because the author was expecting to be appending something to the out variable here, but nothing gets appended. Yeah. Sir, so you haven't found it worth your time to try to use hip hop in production? No. Stop no, because I mean, if, you need, if you're using Postgres, you're out of luck because there is no Postgres support in hip hop, for example, right? So it's a very limited set of extensions. Um, if you're using memcache, you have to use the, fem the Facebook version of memcache. You can't just use the memcache that you're used to using. And there's tons of stuff like that, and it's tough. Plus, compiling it, and each time you make even a tiny change, you have to recompile everything down. And to me, the speed up hasn't been worth it, especially with 5.4 and opcache. It's I mean, if it gave us 10x speed up, yeah, I would probably take the pain. If it's giving us 10% speed up, no. And in my measurements, I haven't done it recently, though, but it's been less than 25%, and, but it depends a lot on the code. And then sometimes, in some cases, it's been slower, which really hurts. All right, so static analysis, good idea. Um, it's a little hard to get it set up and, and working, but basically what you need is um, to go through the docs and compile hip hop and then use this hhvm minus hphp minus t analyze and you feed it a list of files that you can generate just say like find all your php files feed it to it and then spit it out and it'll give you this json output called code error.js that you can just parse um, and it's pretty cool all right i have almost no time but because i want to get some qa in as well 5.5. Five. Now that I've convinced you to upgrade to 5.4, I'll <laughs> try to convince you to go straight to 5.5. Five. Actually, no, 5.5 five isn't out yet, but to let you know what we're working on and what's coming. The list of performance improvements is a little short still. I would love to have some more things in there, but we've done some work on nested calls. Um, so any sort of recursive algorithm should be quite a bit faster in 5.5. Five. We've done some work on pre-allocating the stack in the compiler, so the compiler in general is faster in 5.5, but the big performance difference is that we've now bundled Zen's opcode cache, called opcache, in 5.5. So now there's no excuse for anybody not to be using an opcode cache, because it's, it's going to be there by default. 
And since it's there by default, we've also kind of unified all the various opcode cache efforts on a single code base. Because before it was pretty fragmented with five or six different opcode caches out there and developers all having their own religious beliefs as to which one works the best. Now we get all the developers focused on one and hopefully, maybe by the time we release 5.5, but definitely by the next version, we'll be able to do some tighter integration between PHP and the opcode cache itself. So we should see some performance benefits coming out of that. New features, generators, it's one of the big ones. Um, basically, you can yield at some point inside the function call. You can yield the value and then repeated calls to it will maintain its state and you can just keep sending stuff back. So instead of, for example, have, instead of returning a huge array from a function and having to allocate all that, you can kind of do it step by step. You can, every time you call it, you get the next value. Um, and that's what a generator does. And at the point in your function where you want to yield this next value, you put this yield keyword in there. Which also means this is a new reserved word. So please don't make functions in your current code named yield, or you'll have issues upgrading eventually. We also have finally. So um, you can do any sort of in the try catch type thing. You can have a finally section that will clean up things for you. So whether or not this try um, is successful, you'll always hit the final. So if you try, catch, you do something, finally it's always going to get called, no matter what, even if you had an exception in the middle of things. So it's a little easier if you need to clean up things after your, your calls. This one is kind of a simple little feature. You can do the first level of dereferencing. If you have nested arrays, you can do um, like the first level of dereferencing. You can stick a list in there directly. So just like you do list first comma last equals names, right? It'll take the first um, elements and stick it in first and last. You can now do that directly in the for each. We have added const array and string dereferencing. You saw we did that for functions in 5.4, but now if for, I don't know why you would do it, but if you did have a constant string and you wanted to get the third element of the constant string, right? or element three, which is the fourth element. Um, you can do it directly like that. MT now supports functions and expressions as well. Before, it really only wanted to work on variables, which was a bit limiting. There are times when you do want to do an empty on a function call to see if the function returns something that is actually empty. Curl uploads were kind of strangely implemented. And they are kind of strangely implemented in, in 5.4 and 5.3. If you're doing an upload, you use an ampersand to specify the file name to be uploaded in the curl extension, which can cause problems if users are allowed to specify the file names. Then users can basically spoof and say, okay, well, I wouldn't like to upload at stuff in there, which can then cause you to go and upload files from your file system that you didn't necessarily expect to be uploaded. So it's kind of a weird way it's implemented. You have to be careful when you're using curl for file uploads. Um, we've completely rewritten it to remove those problems. We've also added a simplified password hashing API because we found that a lot of people didn't understand how to hash passwords correctly. And we've now sort of put a, a high level layer on that. So even if you're a complete idiot, you can just type a hash password, right? And it'll give you back a properly hashed password with enough entropy and all the things that you need um, before you kind of had to think about it and, and do it right. And people hate to think. Um, so please help us out as well. PHP runs on I don't know, 244 million websites, I think was the last number I saw, which is like 75% of the web. It's, it's crazy. The, the reach of PHP is crazy. The amount of people who actually work on PHP is tiny. It's very, very small. I'd like to get more people involved. And you don't have to be a big time C hacker. Even though PHP is written in C, there are lots of ways you can help us out. Just with stupid little things, once a month, hit qa.php.net, for example, and download the latest release candidate and compile it. So usually it helps if you compile it with something that resembles your current configuration of PHP. You can get that 
from PHP minus I, which gives you, it tells you how your PHP was compiled. Because then you can compile another version of PHP with exactly the same flags, and you can get basically a drop-in replacement. You can just drop in this new version of PHP, and you can test it and see if anything breaks. If something unexpected comes up, you can report it. And we can maybe fix it before we release the next version so that it won't break your app when you upgrade. So it benefits you too. Um, Configure, build it. You can run make test, which will run like 13, 14,000 tests that come with PHP. The test look like something look something like this. You'll get a failed test summary, whatever tests are failed. It'll ask you at the at the end if you want to send it to us. You can just say yes, send it to us. But you can also go in and dig into some of these, just try to figure out why did the test fail. So when a test fails, it'll drop a couple of files in the directory that the test is in. One of them is a diff file, which is just the difference between the expected output and the actual output that the test spat out. The other files are expected, the output, um, the PHPT is the test itself, and it'll drop a shell file that'll let you run just that test as well if you need to. So in this particular case, the diff says it was expecting zero integer, but got one integer when running it. And then it's a matter of trying to figure out why did that differ? Is the test bad or is there something that changed in the code? Did Postgres change? What, what went different there? Or MySQL in this case, actually. You can also help us write new tests. This is a testing system I came up with about 17 years ago now, I think. And it's the absolute easiest testing framework in the world. This is not PHP unit or JUnit or anything like that. All you do is you put a little snippet of PHP code and you put the expected output. That's a completely valid test, right? So you've passed this PHPT file to the run test and it'll run the PHP snippet and it'll check the output. If they match, great, test passes. You can have some conditionals in there. So you can have a little snippet of the PHP code that'll figure out if it should skip the test. So for example, if you're testing something in input filter and if the user doesn't have input filter loaded, you can print out skip. Basically, any code snippet that prints skip will cause the test to be skipped on that platform. You can also specify if the test needs post or get input, you can specify those in blocks and then you can run the test. And there are other sections like that. But I would love to see more people help us write tests. Um, and to figure out where we might need some help, if you go to qa.php.net, you can, oh, where is it? Test gcub, sorry. You can click on gcub here, and you can pop into 5.5, and we can see the coverage. And here we can see that we have some coverage issues on a lot of extensions. That actually might be because GCUB isn't running 5.5 very well yet. Let's see, let's do it 5.4 first. It's not actually that bad. Yeah, I think GCUB isn't quite up to 5.5, but even on 5.4 we could use some help. So in here, basically, this is saying that um, the FTP extension only has 60% coverage. Right? So you can go in here and you can click on an individual file, ftp.c, for example, and basically the orange are things that have not been tested. The blue are things that test, case, test cases cover currently, but in this particular case, when this condition, FTP FD is not negative one, this has never been tested by a test case. So it's a matter of looking through some of this. If you know a little bit of C, you can read C code, and then you have to sort of translate that to a test case. Like, what user space code can I run to exercise this particular bit of code? That will cover, increase the code coverage there. So a bit of help there would be great. Also find or file useful bug reports. There's a few really stupid bug reports we've had. One of my favorites is this one somebody complaining about number format, basically. That number format on an empty string changed at some point. Why you would number format an empty string, I don't know. But it was a huge thing about it. And at some point, um, he starts asking about escalating 
which I really like. Oh yeah, here we go. So I was answering, and then he says, please escalate this to someone who can answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> and my response to it was escalate. Oh, how I wish I could escalate <laughs> to someone. <laughs> but anyway, it, it gets a little frustrating. And on tests, so where I we could really use some help is just to go through and help us triage some of these tests. So we have a random. There's, if you go to bugs.php.net, you'll see a random, or you just go to bugs.php.net slash random. It's basically going to pick a random open test. Um, so here's the test on get host by name. It's kind of old. You can go through, you can look at the history. Um, and we haven't quite figured out what to do with it. This one may not be a great example, but many times there's just a huge code snippet and it takes someone to actually run the code snippet and figure out what's wrong with this particular code. Is it user error? Is it, is it actually a bug? Can we make the code snippet smaller? Can we narrow it down to a single function that isn't doing what it's expected to do? And if you could just add a comment to the bug that says, hey, I had a look at this. It looks like this particular function is the problem. Here's a much shorter code snippet. It really helps us out because about a third of all reported bugs are completely not bugs at all. And it takes our time. There's only maybe 10 to 15 of us at any one time actually hacking on PHP. And we get 50 to 75 new bugs a day. And we can't spend all our time reading stupid bug reports. So it would be really, really helpful if every now and then when you didn't know what to do, just go to bugs.php.net slash random and, and fix some of them. And add some comments, yes. Curious, how do you how do you juggle having a, a full time job at Etsy and uh, hacking on PHP? I, I've been doing it for 18 years now, so I'm kind of used to it. But it's 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 juggling, yes. It's and it's one thing that people don't understand is that I work on things I need. I don't necessarily work to solve your problem. I don't care that much about your problem, <laughs> right? If you report an interesting problem that I think, hey, I might hit that problem one day, then I might work on it. <laughs> but if you report a problem to me about PHP on Windows XP talking to ODBC, I don't give a crap. Because <laughs> right? I know I will never need it, and people get very offended when I, when I hint at the fact that I don't care about your bug report. Because I, I, I do PHP. I'm not sort of altruistic in that sense. I don't. I'm not out to improve the world with PHP. I'm just building a hammer that's useful to me. It happens to be useful to you too. That's great. But it's more about me than about you. And, <laughs> and that's, that's the only way that I can juggle this stuff. I can't go 18 years of my life solving your problems for free. Right? That just doesn't work. I have to have a job. I have to do things. I, I'm actually solving real people's problems in, in the jobs and the projects that I'm on. So um, I wish more people would kind of see that side of open source development, that, that if you want something fixed, you have to put in a little bit of effort. You have to actually file good bug reports. You have to dig into the code. If you don't know how to code, maybe ask a friend that does to help you out and give us something to work with. We have a lot of bug reports that just say, it don't work, fix it. It's not going to get fixed, sorry. All right, now I'm really running out of time. Where's my presentation? I think I'm done. Oh, yeah. I was just going to show the last slide. Um, what else did I have? Come on, go. My keyboard is lost. Okay, I will, ah, I can't type anymore. That is depressing. I can click, but I can't type. Oh, all tab works, it must work then. There we go, okay. So a third of the bug reports aren't actually, don't know where to start, go to random. Help us out in the doc team as well. We have edit.php.net. It's a nice online WYSIWYG doc editor. If you see a documentation problem, don't just complain and blog or Twitter about it. Actually go and fix it. And you'll see every manual page has a little edit button on it. You hit edit, you go directly to the WYSIWYG and you can submit 
um, a patch to the docs right there. It's very easy to do. There's a wiki where you can add RFCs if you have some feature you want to add it. Um, so basically, if you're not on 5.3 yet, please get on 5.3 at least. But I prefer you go tr straight to 5.4 and help us test 5.5 and find some way to contribute to PHP, please, if you use it every day. I would appreciate it. Thank you.